Hello and welcome to the Roland MC303 video manual. Now during the course of this video we're actually going to explore together the various features and functions of the unit in quite some detail. However, I would recommend that you keep your owner's manual close to hand since there are various listings contained within which we will need to actually refer to from time to time. Things such as the, the tone list or the, the quantized template list, things like that. Okay, but well, without any further ado, let's actually take an overview of the unit. Well, here's the unit, and in case you're wondering what this device is here, this is actually a small television camera. We're actually using this to get some uh, more interesting shots of the controls. Okay, well, the MC303 can be thought of as three discrete units in one box. We have a controller section, we have a sequencer section, and a sound source section. So let's start by looking at the controller section. What exactly do I mean by controller? Well, two things really. If you take a look at the front panel, you can see down here we have a keyboard. It's actually laid out in a slightly unusual way, but it works just like a MIDI keyboard. Okay, so I can actually input data and I can play sounds directly from the keyboard. Each of the keys actually has a secondary function associated with it, and written underneath each of the keys you can see various options. We use these when we're editing, so I'll come on to that later on. Okay, what other controls do we have? Well, over here we have four knobs. These are actually labeled real-time modify, and we can actually use these to change the sounds that we're playing as we play them. For example, I can make changes to the envelope of the sound or even the filtering on the fly. Okay, so that's what I mean by the controller section. The sound source section. Well, the MC303 actually contains 448 sampled sounds. And you can think of these, if you like, as the different instruments contained within the unit. We also have 12 drum kits. And the kits actually consist of drum sounds taken from well-known Roland drum machines. Okay, so there's an awful lot of uh, sound potential there. Now, the sounds themselves are divided up into eight parts. You can think of each part as being like uh, a musician in a band, if you like. You've got the drummer, and you have seven other musicians. So in total, eight parts. And each of these parts can take on any one of the 448 instrument sounds. So that's the sound source. What about the sequencer? Well, the sequencer is very much like a multi-track tape recorder, but in this case, we're not using tape or anything like that. What we're using is uh, a digital recording system which will actually record MIDI information rather than sound. So as I'm playing sounds from the keyboard, for example, or as I'm twiddling with my control knobs, changing the sounds in real time, I can actually record all of this performance information directly to the sequencer. And we can build up what is referred to as a pattern. Now the pattern is the, the building block of your composition, if you like. We can chain together various patterns to create a song, just as you would expect to do with a drum machine for example. So that's the basic layout. Now let's actually take a quick look at the back panel and see how we can actually uh, hook up to our amplification and so on. Starting at this end, first we have the power switch and next to this is the main DC input. Over here we have a couple of sockets labelled MIDI. Now some of you may be familiar with MIDI. We have a MIDI in and a MIDI out socket. It's actually possible to hook the MC303 up to an external MIDI keyboard so we can actually play the sounds from the external keyboard rather than using the built-in keyboard. We can also do such things as hooking up two MC303s together. We can also dump information from within the unit to a MIDI sequencer, for example. So MIDI can be quite useful in all sorts of other ways. We'll look at that in more detail later on. Over here, we have a socket labelled foot switch. This is actually an assignable facility we can actually set up a foot switch to start and stop the machine, create loops, all sorts of other things, which again we'll look at later on. These are the main outputs. Now, some of the uh, samples contained within the MC303 and certainly the effects are stereo. So if you have the facility, uh, it would be a good idea to actually use stereo amplification. The sort of thing you could use, maybe a hi-fi or a PA system, I wouldn't recommend the use of things like guitar amplifiers. What you really need is a full range amplification system in order to really benefit from the sound quality that the MC303 offers. Okay, over here we have the headphone socket and finally a low boost control. This, if you like, is simply a bass boost or cut rotary control. If you don't see this display, then check these two things. Firstly, that the play mode is set to pattern. We can actually switch 
between song and pattern mode by pressing the play mode button. That needs to be set to pattern. And also, this control up here, we need to select pattern song as displayed by the indicator underneath pattern song. So, assuming you have the display A01, A01, these actually refer to the various pattern numbers. Okay, the patterns within the unit are divided up into eight separate banks. The first three banks, banks A, B, and C, are preset patterns. So let's take a quick look at those. Now, by rotating the dial, we can actually move through the various patterns available. And if we want to move swiftly through, we can hold down the shift button at the same time and move in groups of ten, just like that. Okay. Well, when a, when a pattern is actually displayed, by pressing the play button in the sequencer section, we can instantly hear that pattern. Let's press stop. And you can see here that the pattern is displayed twice. Over here, we read current. This is the current pattern being played. And here we see the next pattern to be played. All this means is that when A11 reaches the end, it will move on to the pattern which is displayed here. At the moment, that happens to be the same. But we can actually change this. So, for example, if I'm playing pattern A11, I can then use the dial to select the next pattern to be played. And you can see there that once the first or current pattern had reached the end, this started to flash and then moved swiftly on with no apparent join or gap. Okay, you can see here there's a little dot right next to the, the next pattern. All this means is that I've actually stopped the pattern halfway through its tracks. If I actually want to rewind to the beginning of that pattern, I hold down shift and press the backward button. Or to the end of that pattern, shift forward. Okay. Now, as the pattern is playing back, we can actually change the tempo of the pattern in beats per minute. This is simply the number of quarter notes per minute. So let's start the pattern playing. Now, using the select controls, I'm going to move all the way to the left. And we can see that the LED referring to tempo is shown, and the display reads 147.0. This is the tempo, the BPM. And I can rotate the dial now and change the tempo in one-tenth of a BPM. Or once again, by holding down the shift button at the same time, I can move more swiftly. So gradually reducing and then increasing the tempo. That's one way of affecting the tempo. Let's just move this back to the pattern song display. Another way of doing it is to use what's known as tap tempo. Now there's a control down here marked tap. Now if I actually tap out in time as the music's playing, we can actually generate the tempo relating to my tap. So, I tap slightly slower. One, two, three, four. You can see that the music is adapted to follow the tempo that I set up. Faster. And even faster. One, two, three, four. And it's quite a neat design because it actually takes the average of four taps to calculate the new BPM. So it's very, very accurate and it's a very handy way of actually synchronizing the MC303 to, for example, a, a record deck playing back or some other piece of music that's actually free running. So that's how you adjust the tempo. Now you may have noticed by this point that some of the patterns seem longer than others. While well, some of the patterns consist of four measures, others consist of eight measures. And uh, it's actually possible to create a pattern up to 32 measures long. Now, it's also possible to create patterns using time signatures other than 4-4. If you need at any point to see um, how many measures you have in a pattern and what the time signature is, you can press this button here marked Scale Measure. I've actually selected pattern A04. If I press Scale Measure, I see that it consists of four measures or bars and that it is actually currently stopped at position measure for beat two. If I play the pattern and then press Scale Measure again, you can see this displayed in real time. So beat and measure. Quite a handy device. Well, so far we've looked at some of the preset patterns and we've learned how to uh, select the next pattern when playing current pattern. We also know how to change the tempo, uh, either on the fly using the tap tempo control or by setting the tempo manually. 
Okay, well let's now take a more detailed look at what a pattern contains. Well obviously we have our main rhythm part, the drum part, but in addition to that we have seven other parts. Okay. Now it's actually possible, whilst the pattern is playing back, to mute the various components of the pattern. Now what I want you to do next is press the part mute button down here. We have three options, part select, part mute, rhythm mute. Press part mute and the, the light in the button should illuminate. Now the part buttons actually display the various components that are active within the pattern. So for example in pattern A21 we have a rhythm part playing, part 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 and 7 are all playing, simply part 1 that isn't. Okay. Now if we actually rotate the dial and select a different pattern you can see that the different patterns contain different active parts. For example pattern A35 uses part 4, pattern A36 doesn't and you can tell because the button's light or not, as the case may be. So let's go back to A21. I'll start playing the pattern. Now because I'm in part mute mode, these buttons actually function as mute buttons now, so I can actually remove the entire rhythm part, just leaving the other instrumental parts. Let's actually remove parts two, three, and four. Bring in the drums again. and then add the remaining parts. So it's a very handy way of actually breaking down the pattern on the fly, very, very useful performance tool. It's often nice to be able to remove the, uh, the rhythm part and build it up and then gradually reintroduce it. Alternatively, we can actually mute the individual rhythm parts. Okay, so if we now press the button mark rhythm mute, again, the buttons change their function. Now each of the buttons corresponds to a different rhythm instrument sound. So. On this button we have the bass drum, here we have the snare, hi-hat, claps and so on. So let's once again start the pattern playing. This time I'm going to actually mute bass drum and snare. Let's try taking out the hi-hat and claps as well. Put them all back in. So that's how we actually mute parts and individual rhythm instruments. Now, a quick word of warning here. If after fast-forwarding or rewinding through a particular pattern, you find that uh, playback is incorrect, it uh, could just be that you've actually bypassed some of the important data which is used to set up the various sounds within that pattern. For example, changes in volume or incorrect playback pitch could be as a result of fast-forwarding and rewinding. So we have a feature called MIDI Update. So if you're actually playing a pattern from anywhere other than the beginning, simply hold down Shift and Stop and you'll get a MIDI update. And you can see there the display actually reads update briefly. And now the pattern will play back correctly. Now another useful performance tool is the real-time transpose function. Over here you can see the button marked transpose. If we press this, the display shows TPS for transpose 3. This means transpose up 3 semitones. And we can adjust this anywhere between plus 24 up two octaves, in other words, to minus 24, down two octaves. So let's just set that to three for the time being. I'm going to start the pattern playing, and you can hear that when I actually press the button, I can toggle between the transposed version and the original version. When the transposed button is illuminated, it means that we're transposed, and when it's extinguished, it means that we're in the original key. Okay. I can actually change the key as it's playing as well, just by holding down the button. And this is a global control, which means it affects all patterns. It's not something which is stored as part of the pattern. Now, in a live performance situation, it is obviously very inconvenient selecting patterns using the value dial. It may be that you need to move swiftly from one pattern to another and yet they're separated by a great distance in memory. So we can actually set up a range of patterns on the individual keys of the keyboard here and this is called the pattern set. So let's go over here and actually light up the pattern set button. If I now press the, the individual keys you can see that the display shows a range of different patterns. Okay well let's start this playing. I'm going to start by selecting key number seven, and you can see here I've actually got pattern A49 set up on that key. 
If I now press key 8, just as though I had selected the pattern using the value dial, I've actually assigned my next pattern. Let's try number 9. And so on. So that actually gives me 16 patterns that I have instant access to. Now, the actual pattern set is completely user definable, so I can select any one of the unit's patterns and store them anywhere under these keys. And I actually have 30 different pattern sets to choose from. Now, the unit already comes with uh, a range of examples, and we can actually set, select the different pattern sets using the control up here. If I actually move and I select one step to the left, I see the pattern set number, PTS, pattern set number. And now using the octave up and down buttons, or the value dial, I can select up to 30 different pattern sets. And once again, they're all completely user definable. So we can actually set up 16 times 30 different patterns, one on each key. OK. Now, how do you actually register your own favorite patterns to one of these keys? Now I'm going to show you how to actually register a pattern within a pattern set. First thing we do is actually select the pattern that we wish to assign. There's B24. Now I actually want to set that up so that it is selected when I press key number one. So first go into pattern set mode. And whilst actually holding down the pattern set button, press key number one. The key lights briefly, and that has now assigned B24 to the key. If I go to 2, you can see I've got B22 set up on key 2, back to 1, and it's remembered B24. OK? You can even do this on the fly, so as a pattern is playing, you can register it. So once again, let's try registering pattern B30 to key 3. Let's just check the pattern. OK, hold down the pattern set button, press key number 3, and that now registers B30 to key 3. So I can actually do that for the whole keyboard, all 16 notes. And not just that, I can actually change the pattern set number. So I have 30 lots of 16. So it's a very, very convenient way of actually setting up the patterns for instant access, uh, especially useful when playing live. As I've already explained, the MC303 uses various types of patterns. We have the preset patterns, banks A, B, and C. We also have the user patterns. They are patterns denoted by the letter U, and we'll come on to those later on. We also have a range of patterns called variation patterns, and these are banks L through to Q. Now, although variation patterns are user writable, they don't actually contain any musical information at all. All they contain is the mute information. So, for example, you can actually start with a preset pattern, mute various parts, either in the rhythm or in the main pattern part combination and store those settings into a variation location. And there are actually 300 different variation locations. So uh, even though you're dealing with preset patterns, you can actually change them in such a way as to create your own customized versions of them. So let's have a look and see how you actually register a pattern into a variation memory location. So I've got pattern A41 ready to go here. Now first check that the pattern set indicator is off and play the pattern. Well, that's my pattern. What I'd like to do is actually take um, some of those parts. I actually want to mute the rhythm part, though, because that's the bit I don't want to use. So what I can actually do is go to part mute, as before, and mute the rhythm part. Let's have a listen. OK, that's it. That's exactly what I want. I'm now going to store that modified pattern into a variation memory location. Okay. Now to do that, I have to use a combination of keys down here. Under each of the keyboard keys, you can see there are two alternative functions, one written in white and one written in black. Those shown in black are shift functions, which means we access them by holding down the shift button and pressing the key at the same time. Those shown in white are edit functions, and we access these by holding down the shift and function button and the key at the same time. So I'm actually going to go to variation right here, which is just underneath 
key 13. So I hold down shift and function and press key 13. Okay, so it's asking me whether I want to write to location L01. And remember, L is a variation memory location. It's not possible to write to anything other than a variation location because, as I said earlier, variation memory locations simply store the mute status of the rhythm and parts. Okay, so I can select the location here. Let's go for L10. If I press Enter now, the display asks, are you sure? Press once again, and now that modified pattern is stored in L10. And just to show that, there it is. And that's permanent. If you switch the machine off, it will still be there again when you boot up. Here I have selected pattern B13, which sounds like this. Now, still in part mute mode, I can see that this pattern actually contains a rhythm part plus parts 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. But at this stage, I don't actually know which sounds are selected for which parts. Well, it's easy for me to find out. All I have to do is press the Part Select button, and at this point, I can isolate the individual parts within the pattern simply by pressing the Part Select buttons. So the rhythm part, part 2, part 3, and so on. But I still can't see the actual tones that are being used. So what I do is I scroll along to the right using the select buttons until tone is indicated. And at this point, the main display will show me a tone bank number and a tone number. OK, well, this happens to be tone bank number 2, tone 36. And if I select one of the other part buttons, say part 2, I see that the sound in this case is tone bank 2, sound 9. Part 5 is tone bank 18, sound 9. Now, cleverly, Roland have organized the 448 tones into discrete banks, so that, for example, all of the tones within bank 6 are string sounds. All of the tones within bank 2 are bass sounds. And another useful feature, whenever you happen to be viewing a sound within a pattern, that sound becomes instantly playable from the keyboard. So, for part 4, I have keyboard access. If I go to part 5, Again, different sound, but playable from the keyboard. So that's how we view the sounds associated with each of the parts in the pattern. When you're actually viewing a particular tone uh, for a part within a pattern, it's actually possible to change the sound or substitute the sound that was there for something quite new. And also, when you're actually making the change, you can audition the sound directly from the keyboard. So, for example, Part 3 in pattern B13 is shown as tone bank 10, sound 9. And if I play the keyboard, I can actually hear that sound. Now, if I want to change that tone, I simply rotate the dial and select a different sound. Maybe if I was selecting a bass sound, I'd go to tone bank 2, sound 30. Well, that's actually a bass sound, but it's in the wrong register. Now, if I want to actually play the sound directly from the keyboard, I need to actually shift the octave. Using these controls here, octave, shift, plus and minus, we can actually move the octave range of the keyboard. So that although this is a keyboard with 16 semitone range, we can actually increase the range drastically by shifting either plus or minus up to four octaves. So the bass range would be somewhere around minus two octaves. This is also handy when experimenting with the rhythm instrument. If I select part rhythm, I can access directly 16 of the rhythm sounds. But of course, there are many more sounds available than that. So if I want to find, for example, the, the bass drum and snare, I know I've got to shift down two whole octaves. And there they are. OK? So that's how we select different tones for parts within a pattern. The MC303 lets you adjust or modify various parameters associated with the selected tone. These are actually the part parameters. And when we make these adjustments, we're actually editing part parameters. OK, well, the kind of parameters I'm talking about are parameters which allow us to uh, change the nature of the sound, the way it is heard. And if you look at the top of the unit, you can see 
the real-time modify controls here show us that we have control over, for example, the envelope of the sound. There are some filter controls. Okay, there's a thing called an LFO, which actually stands for Low Frequency Oscillator, and we'll come onto that in due course. We have control over two discrete effects units built into the unit. We can adjust the portmento, which again I'll explain soon, the level of the sound, the panning of the sound. So let's actually look at each of these parameters in turn. We're going to start by checking out the, the level controls. How can we actually mix the levels, the relative levels, of the various parts within a pattern? Okay, so I've got selected pattern A11. Let's just have a quick listen to that. Now let's suppose I want to adjust the level or volume of the drum part. First, I select rhythm over here. So I'm actually targeting the rhythm part. And as before, I can play it directly from the keyboard. Now to actually change the level of that particular part, I use this control here. Now you can see the control itself actually has two functions. When we're actually adjusting the filter, it is actually used as the cutoff control. I actually want to access the secondary function here, which is shown highlighted level. Now, any function that's actually shown with this sort of inverse highlight is accessed using the function button. Down here, this button marked function is also uh, highlighted. So if we actually depress the button, light it up, this control will now adjust the level of the drum part. Simply by rotating the control, I can increase or decrease the level. If you actually need to see the absolute value of the level at any point, we can hold down shift and function and rotate the dial. And this will work with any of the parameter changes. And you can see the display reads level up to a maximum of 127 down to a minimum of zero. Now, I don't actually have to stop the playback in order to make this adjustment. Let's just run the pattern. You can hear there, gradually fading the drums in and out. Let's target one of the other parts. Let's go for part four. And you can hear the main sort of keyboard part fading in and out. So that's how we can make adjustments to the mix on the fly, a very handy way of actually modifying the, the overall sound of the pattern in real time. We also have control over the pan position of any of the sounds within the pattern. This is the control, and once again we have pan pot highlighted. So over to my function button, press it once, light it up, and this will now control the pan position of my selected sound. You notice as soon as I actually move the control, the real-time modify LED lights up, showing me that we've actually modified one of the part parameters. Okay, select your sound, and then pan the sound. Now you won't actually hear this because the, the recording is actually in mono, but if you're running in stereo, you will actually hear the sound sweep between the speakers actually moving within the stereo sound field from left to right or anywhere in between. Okay, so the idea is you can actually set up a mix, putting each of the sounds of the pattern in a different place, which is nice, it creates a lot of space. Alternatively, there is a feature called random pan. This is found over here. Now, this button actually has, once again, two functions. Highlighted, we see porter, that stands for portamento, but we'll, we'll worry about that later on. Random pan is not highlighted, so we come out of function by pressing the function button once. And if we now switch random pan on, the button will light, and now every time I play a note, the sound will actually appear at a different pan position. So this is a completely random panning effect, which again is a very nice way of creating a slightly more exciting random sound. So this is random pan, and this is a fixed pan. One point worth noting here, any adjustment I make to any of the parts simply affects that single part. So for example, if I switch random pan on for part four, and then go to part five, you see that the random pan light is extinguished. So I'm only affecting part four, and that's true of all of the part parameters. Okay. Also, if you're making adjustments to the part and you, you get in a mess and you want to go back to the original sound, simply by reselecting the sound, 
you will initialize the sound back to its basic state. And you can see that the real-time modify LED actually went out then. So if, if you're in trouble, just reinitialize the sound by reselecting the sound. The Portamento control is actually something which has been taken from some of the early uh, synthesizer designs. Now, I have a sound here, which is a sawtooth waveform, as you will see if you refer to the owner's manual. Tone bank 1, sound 5. Let's just play a simple interval. If I now switch on the portmento effect, once again, function, portmento, you can see that what we actually get is a glide between the two notes. And the glide time can be adjusted using the portmento time. So if I reduce the portmento time, we get an almost instantaneous glide. If I increase it, we can lengthen the glide time. Now it's essential that when using the portamento effect that the, the actual synthesizer part is monophonic and by that I mean we can only play one note at a time. And this actually manifests itself as a thing called last note priority. So if I hold down a key and then play a second key, the original key stops sounding and we move to the new key. Again let's add a lower key, we move to the new key. Of course, when we're not using the portmento effect, we have the basic standard polyphonic sound, which means I can play more than one note at a time, up to 28 notes, in fact, which is the polyphony of the MC-303. The MC-303 contains a low-pass filter. This is a device, just here, which is used to change the timbre of the sound. Now I have two controls, cutoff and resonance, and to access those controls I need first to make sure that my function indicator is dark, so we're actually accessing the non-highlighted functions. Okay, cutoff and frequency. Well, let's just play back this pattern. I'm going to isolate part four, and you can hear there, playback from the keyboard. If I actually change the cutoff, frequency as I'm playing the sound, you can hear how the sound changes. I'm actually altering the frequency content of the sound. This is the cutoff frequency of the filter, and as I rotate it anti-clockwise, I'm actually removing more and more of the treble frequencies within the sound. As I rotate clockwise, I increase the amount of treble in the sound. Now the resonance control actually allows me to change the intensity of the effect, so if I back it right off, you can hear a much more subtle effect. If I increase it to maximum, we have a much more intense sound. Really, really handy device for uh, use with bass sounds, for example, or maybe filter sweeped string parts. When we actually change the cutoff frequency of the sound as the pattern is playing, you can really see how things start to cook. You can really sort of articulate the sound, almost make it speak using the filter. I have a string sound here ready to go. That's my basic string part. Now, over here we have the envelope controls. We have a button here marked Attack Decay. All this means is that the control knob will actually function to change the decay of the sound when the button is lit, or the attack of the sound when the button is not lit. So let's just control the attack for a moment. What does the attack mean? Well, this is how quickly the sound comes in fastest attack will be in the minimum position. So the sound actually plays instantly. When I press the key, I get the sound. If I increase the attack time, I can actually make the sound fade in. Which is handy if we're using sort of synth pad sounds or strings where you often need uh, to articulate the sound in a, in a different way as you bring it in slowly. We can control the decay of the sound, so if we press the button, 
Now this is the amount of time that's taken before the sustain level part of the sound is reached. And for some sounds, this will have no effect. Things like guitars and pianos actually have a decay time of zero. Okay, but for string sounds, you can hear how the sound changes. We also have control over the release, so let's switch that off. If we go to our function indicator now, like the indicator, this now controls the release time. This is simply the time taken for the sounds to die away once you've released the key. In the minimum position, we have an instant stop. If I increase it, the sound carries on playing for a while after I release the keys. Up to maximum. So they're the envelope controls. Now as we've already seen, the MC303 contains an LFO, which actually stands for Low Frequency Oscillator. And it's found just here. This is actually a simple generator. It generates a signal which can be used to control other parameters within the sound. So we can actually use the LFO to modulate the level of the sound, the filter cutoff, of the sound, and also the pitch of the sound. Now, if we modulate the level, we create a tremolo effect. If we modulate the filter, we can create wah-wah effects. And if we modulate the pitch, then we're actually creating vibrato effects. So here's a sound, tone bank one, sound 30. What I'm first going to do is actually assign the LFO to control pitch. Now you can see under key 10 is shown pitch. This is a shift function, so we hold down shift and press pitch. And the display shows for part four, the amount of control of pitch from the LFO is actually nothing at the moment, so there'll be no effect. Let's increase this to maximum 127. Then hit the exit button to come back to the tone display. If I now play a note on the keyboard, and then increase the LFO modulation depth by pressing this button and lighting it. You can see that I'm creating a vibrato effect. I'm actually modulating the pitch of the sound. And I can increase the depth all the way up to absurd levels or reduce it. So I'm changing the depth of the modulation, but I've got a fixed rate there. Well, if I actually want to change the speed of the modulation, I simply switch this button again, and you can see that printed on the front panel here we have a key which shows for modulation depth the light needs to be on, for rate it needs to be off. So now I'm ready to control the rate. So you can see the range of control there. Let's try something else. Rather than assigning the LFO to pitch control, let's assign it to filter cutoff control. So once again, Shift pitch, and then let's reduce that back to zero, where it was originally. If we now go shift filter, I'm going to increase the filter control of the LFO to maximum. Once again, exit. Let's play the same key. And you can hear now we've created a wah-wah effect. All we're doing is simply sweeping the cutoff frequency of the filter using the low frequency oscillator. And again, I can change the, the depth and the rate. And just as with the pitch and the filter, I can do exactly the same thing with the level of the sound, so I can create an undulating level or tremolo effect. Now this is a really great tool because it means we can completely change the way the sound is actually played back. And ideal if we try to sort of synchronize the, the LFO speed, with the pattern that the sound is being played back in, we can create all sorts of unusual rhythmic effects. Now, one other point. We can actually change the wave shape of the LFO as well. So you can hear there, we're modulating the cutoff frequency smoothly and slowly. If I actually go to Shift Wave, I can see that we're actually using a sine wave modulator. And I have a choice of waveforms. 
random one, random two, square wave, sawtooth wave, triangle wave. Let's just hear how they sound. That's the sine wave modulator. This is random, which means we're actually stepping the cutoff in a random way. This is a smooth version of random one, so rather than stepping, we're actually moving smoothly, but in a very random way. Square wave, this is simply moving from one level to another. Sawtooth wave, which is moving smoothly up to a point, then dropping instantly. Triangle, which moves smoothly up and smoothly down. And they are the different waveforms available. So that's the LFO section. Now if you're using an external MIDI keyboard to control the sounds in the MC-303, you will need to set up the bend range parameter. If we go shift, key 13, which is the bend range, we can actually set the amount of pitch bend that you'll get when using the controller on the keyboard for each of the parts individually. So for part one, we can set up a bend range of 24 semitones, two octaves. Maybe for part three, a bend range of six semitones. This means that we'll get plus and minus six semitones of pitch bend when we use the pitch bend controller on the keyboard. Now, even though the patterns of the MC-303 are designed to use the internal sounds, it is actually possible to switch any of the eight parts to transmit its information externally via the MIDI out socket. So if you actually want to trigger the drums off a separate module, for example, you can do that very easily. All we have to do is go shift output assign, which is located under key 14. And you can see there for every part, we can make an adjustment and switch from internal to external. So rather than playing back the internal sound, that information will now be transmitted externally via the MIDI out, but only on part four. Well, so far I've been making adjustments to the part parameters of preset patterns. Now bear in mind that the presets are not changeable, so as soon as I select another pattern, I will lose any of the changes that I've made. If you need to actually store permanently any of the changes you make, you'll first need to copy the preset pattern into a user memory location, and we're going to do that later on. Once that's done, all you've done is transfer the pattern data. If you then modify the part settings, you'll need to perform what's known as setup right, which is located just down here. And what this does is it actually stores the various sound and part settings that you've made to the pattern. And again, we're going to look at that later on as well. The MC-303 contains two effect processors. The first processor will give us reverb and delay effects, and the other one will give us chorus and flanging effects. So let's start by taking a look at the reverb processor. I have a basic drum loop here. Now at the moment that's actually playing back dry. There are no effects on that at all. I need to add some reverb. The first thing I do is go to my control knob here, where it says effect. And you can see that this, once again, is a multi-function knob. I need to make sure that I'm actually addressing the reverb parameters. So the first thing to do is check that this button is not lit. Next, I need to choose whether I want it to control effects level or reverb time. And let's go for effects level. So I'm going to switch into function. Let's run the loop and gradually increase the amount of reverb on the drum sound. You can hear that working. But if you want to... Uh, confirmation of that. Once again, we can hold down shift and function and view the absolute level as displayed. So let's put that back to maximum. Now by coming out of function mode, I can control the reverb time. So that's actually the maximum reverb time, simulating a large hall. And we can shorten it, thereby simulating maybe a smaller room. Okay, well there are further settings we can make. That, as I say, is a global control. If we need to make 
individual reverb settings for each of the parts, we can do so. Shift, key six, and we can access the individual send levels to the reverb effect from each part. So my rhythm part is at a maximum of 127. Part two is set to 15, part three, 117 and so on. Now I can change this so I can actually create a reverb mix that's independent of the overall level mix of the sounds within the pattern. I can also change the reverb algorithm, the reverb type. Shift type, which is underneath key five, and I can select room one, two, three, hall one, hall two, plate reverb, and then there are some delay settings or echo settings that we can use instead of the reverb. So that's the reverb effect. We also have a flanger and chorus effect. And in exactly the same way as we control the reverb, we can also control the chorus or flange level over here. So this time, we make sure that this button is lit, so we're controlling flanger and chorus parameters rather than reverb and delay parameters. Let's run the loop. Function, effects level. That's a flanger. And I can change the rate of the flanger. Different sound. And once again, we can set up individual part send levels for the chorus flanger effect over here under key eight. So it's a shift operation. And you can see, just as with the reverb, we can set individual send levels. There are also a range of different types. That was set to flange. We have various chorus options as well. Chorus is an effect which aims to double the sound, thicken it up slightly, and flanging is a much more intense sound, that classic sort of uh, jet aircraft sound, as you heard there. So those are the effects. Now, assuming you've been modifying part parameters of a user pattern, you'll need to actually use the pattern setup right option in order to store your changes permanently. And this is how we do it. I've got pattern U01 set up here. I've actually made changes to the part parameters. Shift function setup right. The display asks me if I'm sure, and I press enter. And that now stores all of the effect settings, all of the part parameters that I've made to that particular pattern. RPS, or real-time phrase sequence, is a feature that allows you to take any part from any pattern in the machine and assign it directly to one of the 16 keyboard pads. Before it will work, you first need to light the RPS set button. So just press it once, the button will light, and now we're ready to trigger your favorite phrases off the individual keys. and I can play up to eight different RPS phrases at one time, so I can actually play the first two together, for example. Add this one. Now, the MC303 comes shipped with up to 30 different RPS sets, and to select a different RPS set, simply use the select controls to move along to where it says RPS set, and then use the data entry controller to change the RPS set. It's also possible to register your own phrase, and this is how we do it. So go back to pattern song. Now we need to select a pattern. Well, let's try A11. Now there's a keyboard phrase in there that I'm actually going to take and register as a separate RPS phrase. So the first thing I need to do is isolate it using part mute. There, I've isolated part four. That's playing happily. What I've got to do now, whilst pressing the RPS set button, I can simply press one of the keyboard pads and it will be registered automatically. So RPS set, whilst holding it down, press, for example, key 16. And that has now registered that phrase.
Obviously, when you're muting the parts, you need to narrow down onto one part. You can only actually register one of the parts as an RPS part. Okay? And of course, we can do that using 30 different RPS sets. The MC-303 contains a very, very useful arpeggiator section. Over here we can see arpeggio, and there's a switch to engage or disengage the effect. I've got a sound here ready set up on part two. If I turn the arpeggiator on, you can hear that it actually automatically creates a broken chord sound for me, an arpeggio. Well, that's actually a bass sound, so I'm going to shift down a couple of octaves. Now, the great feature of the arpeggio is that it's actually in time with the tempo of the pattern that it's playing over. So if I actually start pattern U03, which is just a simple drum loop, I can then create a bass part simply by holding down a chord. And I can go to my real-time modify controls here, and I'm actually going to alter the filter as it plays. Great little feature, a very, very handy way of building up uh, keyboard parts without actually having to play the individual notes. OK, well, there are all sorts of parameters associated with the arpeggiator, and we can see those down here. If we uh, shift arpeggio style on key one, we can actually view a range of preset arpeggio styles. Now, the one I was using there was actually BS.3. This is actually a bass arpeggio. Works very well with bass sounds. But there's a whole range here. We have uh, guitar-style arpeggios, piano-style, clav-style arpeggios. OK, so depending on the kind of sound you're trying to arpeggiate, uh, it'd be wise to pick the appropriate style of arpeggio. There's a range of basic arpeggios here as well, which simply move up and down. We can actually edit the arpeggio in a more detailed way. If we use the select buttons, we can actually move through a range of alternative parameters. Now, there's one arpeggio style called Limitless, LTL. This means we can actually change, firstly, the motif arpeggio. This is the order of the notes, how the arpeggio is actually constructed from the notes you play. And if you refer to the owner's menu, you'll see a listing of the different types of motif available. OK, the beat pattern. Now, this describes the way the notes are structured in terms of their velocity, how hard they're played, and their duration. And again, a listing in the manual is provided so you can see what the differences are. This is the shuffle amount. Let me just show you what this does. If I hold down an arpeggio, shift up an octave or two, open the filter a bit, I can actually make the arpeggio swing. So increasing the value will actually give me more of a, a triplet feel swing. 100%, 0%. Well, I'll be doing more with the arpeggiator later on, so that's the arpeggiator for now. We also have a feature called Play Quantize. Now, what is Quantize? Well, it's, it's a basic template which you can set up before you play back any recorded musical data. What the template will do is actually draw any timing discrepancies into line with a, a fixed grid reference, and you can actually change the grid reference. What do I mean by that? Well, if my timing grid is actually based on 16th notes or semiquavers, I can actually use this template to draw any notes appearing a little bit late or a bit early to that grid point, thereby tightening up any timing inaccuracies. Take one of the preset patterns, B03. First, I need to select which of the parts within the pattern I'm going to apply the play quantize to. And I do this by holding down Shift, Quantize Select. You'll see that the Part Select button flashes. I can then select which of the parts I wish to quantize. Well, let's, let's do the whole lot, all eight parts. Over here we see the play quantize controls. I'm going to switch to grid. If I then go down here to where play quantize is shown, grid, groove, shuffle, shift, grid. 
and we can see the resolution of the grid and this says 16 which means 16th notes. If I move this to uh, 8th notes you can hear that suddenly the patterns change. We're now working in quavers or 8th notes rather than semi-quavers or 16th notes. Take it to 4. Now we're working in quarter notes or crotchets. Back to 16. And we can even go to 30 second notes or demi semi quavers. Okay, well, let's stop that for a moment. So that's a very, very rigid form of quantize. Quite handy when you're recording, for example, to bring everything into time. In addition to the basic grid quantize, we also have what's known as the groove quantize. This is similar, but different in that it not only changes the timing of the pattern information, but also the velocities of the notes within the pattern. And it does this according to a range of preset templates. Well, once again, let's select the part to be quantized. Shift, part select, that's quantize select. And then, once again, I'm going to select all eight parts. Start the pattern playing. Then switch to Groove Quantize, pressing this button twice. You can hear now that they're quantizing or changing not only the timing, but also the velocities. If I go and have a look at my Groove Template, Shift Key 3 shows Template 23. And I have a range of preset Groove Templates here. 71 of them, in fact. So let's just go back to, to 1. Template 4, which has a much more swing-like feel. So it's a very, very quick way of taking a, a preset pattern and changing the groove and tailoring it to a, a, a groove of your choice. And thirdly, we have the shuffle quantize which again is different from both grid and groove quantize. This allows us to quantize um, to create a swing feel to the pattern. So once again, the basic pattern. Let's introduce a shuffle quantize. And you hear how that actually swings the music. Let's have a look at the parameters associated with that. Shift, shuffle, and I can choose the resolution, either triplet, 16th notes, or triplet eighth notes. For this pattern, it tends to work better with triplet sixteenth notes. Now, common to all three quantized modes, we have a control here marked timing or velocity, depending on whether we're using the function or not. If we press the function button, we now have control over how much the velocity changes according to the, the quantize particularly useful when in groove quantize mode, as we can choose whether to simply shift the timings or the velocities or both. So I tend to leave that on maximum. If we switch off the function light, we can now adjust the strength of the timing correction. So uh, once again, 100% timing adjustment according to either grid, shuffle, or groove templates. And I can change that anywhere between 0% and 100% change. So in the case of our shuffle rhythm, I can change the amount of swing by adjusting the quantized timing strength. So that's a very hard swing. And in the middle we have no swing at all. Now, although we've been modifying some of the preset patterns, it is actually possible for you to record your own pattern from scratch. And I'll show you how to do that. We're going to use a technique called real-time recording. There is another way of doing it, but we'll look at that next. Real-time recording. Well, the first thing you need to do is select a user pattern. OK? Now, you need a blank pattern. And you'll know it's blank if it is designated by a lowercase u. OK? 
Now I've actually set up some sounds in U19 here. So that's the first thing we need to do, is actually decide which sounds we're going to use for recording. First thing, maybe the rhythm part. So let's select rhythm, and I've selected the 909 kit here. I could change that, 808, but I want 909. For part one, I'm using sound bank 5, sound 5. Part two, sound bank 2, sound 13. This is actually my bass sound. This is part one. And this is part three. In the wrong octave, just shift that up. And I'll just stick with those basic four parts. So back to rhythm. The next thing we need to do is actually set the recording parameters. So if we press record, we can see that the metronome starts playing. That's fine. I'm actually going to change the tempo of the metronome because I'd like to record the drum part more slowly than it will play back ultimately. So let's use the select controls, move all the way over to tempo, so that the tempo light lights. Let's reduce the tempo, maybe all the way down to, say, 90 BPM. OK. What other recording parameters do we have? Well, I can decide at this point on the length of my pattern, my loop. And I can change that from four measures all the way up to 32 measures. But I'm going to keep it on four. I can also set a count in. When I actually go into record by pressing the play button, I'll actually get two measures counting. And I can change that as well. I could set it to zero so that we start straight away as soon as I hit play. I could set it to one measure counting or two. Or note. Well, this means that we'll actually start recording as soon as I play anything from the keyboard. OK, well, I'll leave that set on two. LOP, well, that actually stands for loop, on or off. I'm going to leave it off. What this function does, basically, is allows me to create a period of rest at the end of the loop. So the loop plays, then it pauses for one measure, then it plays again. And this is useful when you're recording real-time modify information, as it allows a small gap so that you don't run over yourself. In other words, so that what you play at the end doesn't actually follow on to the beginning of the loop. OK, well, we're ready to actually record now, so uh, let's hit the play button. Now, even though I played those drum parts slightly out of time, because I'm actually recording with play quantize, set to 16th notes, it's actually corrected the timing. So I'm ready now to lay down the hi-hats. I don't have to stop, I can go straight in. Now, if you do actually want to rehearse using a particular sound and not actually record it, you can press the record button once more. And we see in the display HRS, this means rehearsal. So I can now hunt around for another drum sound. Well, I'm going to shift up an octave. There's a shaker there, so I'm going to actually drop some shaker in over the top. Press the record button once more. and then maybe add some percussion. And there you hear everything pulled into time. So that's the drum part complete. Now to the bass part. Part select, part two. This is the bass sound. Obviously in the wrong octave. Shift down two octaves. I'm actually using the arpeggiator in this case to create the bass part for me. And once you're in record, any arpeggiated pattern will be recorded as part of the pattern. Let's change the resonance and the cutoff. And we're ready to record. Two bar counting.
Now to part one. We don't need the arpeggiator for this, so I'm going to switch the arpeggiator off. Switch to part one. There's the sound. Record, play. Again, two bar counting. Two, three, four. Now to part three. Start the recording. So there's a pattern using three parts. Now, I didn't actually have to stop recording at any point then. I could have actually selected the sounds all on the fly while still in record mode. And being able to switch back into rehearsal mode is very handy as it allows you to change sounds and hunt around for particular sounds without uh, necessarily knowing where they are. Now once the pattern is recorded, we can then go back and overdub control movements from the real-time modify knobs. So I'm going to target my bass sound, which is actually on part two, and I'm going to adjust the cutoff as I record. Drop into record, press play, again, the usual two-bar counting that I've set up. And now you can hear that the control information has been recorded as well. Well, obviously my, my pattern is still running slow because I've altered the tempo. I'm going to actually put that back up to 120, which is where it was originally. Let's see what that sounds like. There we go. Now, if you make any mistakes when you're recording, it's possible to actually erase notes that have been played in real time. Let's drop into record again. This time I'm recording onto the bass part. If I go to shift transpose, the function shown underneath is actually arrays. The display shows ERS for arrays. If I now hold down the record button, I can erase the bass notes that appear whilst I'm holding down the button. So it's a bit like spot erasing on a piece of tape. It's just like dropping into record. OK, so now I can go back and redo the bass part. Now, as an alternative to real-time recording, we can opt for a step-time recording method. And this differs depending on whether we're recording rhythm instruments or instrument parts. So let's actually concentrate on rhythm step recording. Firstly, select your rhythm instrument. Now, go into record, just press the record button once and set up the recording parameters just as in real-time recording. Tempo, time signature, and measure length. I'm actually going to set that to one measure, so I'm creating quite a small one-bar loop. If I press record again, I go into step record mode, and this indicator lights to show that status. Now, the keys represent something quite different now. Rather than having individual instruments assigned to them, this keyboard represents one measure of my pattern. And I can select a particular instrument sound, whether it be a snare drum or a bass drum or so on, and actually drop it down at specific time locations. So if I press this button, this one, this one, and this one, I'm actually setting up a crotchet or quarter note pulse. So into play, and we're now recording. You don't hear a metronome. If you'd like to hear the metronome, you can do so by pressing this button and this button at the same time. Okay. So now, if I hold down the shift button, I can select my rhythm instrument without recording it. Well, there's my bass drum, so I'm going to start with the bass drum. And I can decide to drop one there, 
one there, one there, one there. Giving me a crotchet or quarter note pulse. Let's go and select the snare drum. Shift, snare. And let's put them on these beats. So you can see how easily we can build up a rhythm part actually specifying the position of the rhythm instrument in time rather than having to actually play it in directly. Now let's try step recording a bass part. It's often quite handy to use the step recording method when recording parts that are very tricky to play live and I'm going to do that with this next bass part. I have a drum loop set up and this is just a one measure loop. So let's select my bass part, there we go, across the keyboard. Let's go into step record mode. Now, what I can do is actually input the bass part in terms of a gate time, a step time, and also a velocity. The three things we need to bear in mind. If I actually go into record by pressing play now, you can see that the part select buttons show two lights. Now these are grouped in two groups of four, just like this. You can see underneath the buttons we have velocity and gate time. Every time I play the keyboard now, I'll be entering a note, and it will be input at a particular lo time location. If I play the note, the clock internally will move on by a given step, and there are 96 clock ticks in a given step, assuming we're working in 16th notes. Okay, now I can also select how hard the note was played, the force with which the note was put down, and that's the velocity. And this I can select over here, and I have a choice of four different velocities. I also have a choice of four different durations for that note, which is called the gate time. Now the gate time is simply a proportion of the step time. Okay, And this can be set up, as can the velocities, by holding down the button and changing the value with the value dial. So my range of velocities, for example, is 20, 64, 100, and 127. But I can modify those just as I can with the gate times, which are at the moment set at 25, 50, 80, and 100 clock ticks. So I'm at the beginning of my measure. I can put down the first bass note. Once I release it, you can see that we've now moved on within the measure by 24 clock ticks. Let's change the velocity for the next note. So I'm simply modifying the velocities each time I drop the notes down. OK, so that's the end of my measure. Now I can play that back. Push stop. And as a result of modifying the velocities as I went along, we've actually we've articulated the bass sound very interesting way. Now if you make a mistake when you're recording, you can simply erase the last note played by holding down shift and moving backwards by pressing the backwards button. Each time you erase a note, you'll actually hear it and it will disappear. Also, it's possible to change the recording scale. At the moment, I'm actually recording 16th notes. But this button here allows me to switch the scale so I can actually choose to record 32nd notes or triplet 8th notes or triplet 16th notes. And you see the, the LED here shows which denomination I'm actually using for recording. So that's step record of an instrument part. Now at any point it's possible to go in and edit the recorded data. This is micro edit mode and it will work just as well with material recorded using real time recording and step time recording. To do it, just press the recording button twice, just like going into step recording mode. Now by rotating the value dial, we can step through the recorded material part by part. So I'm actually viewing the information recorded on the bass track here. 
So for example, the, the bass note recorded on the second beat is shown here. And I can actually see, displayed on the keyboard here, the actual note value. If I press it, I can see the velocity of that note. And by using these controls, select left and right, I can also see the gate time. When I see the gate time, I can change the gate time. So I can increase it to 25. I can also change the velocity of that note. And that will be permanently changed. Let's try the next note. OK. This is the position of the note. Here is the note. If I press it down, I see a velocity of 100 and a gate time of 19. And I can change both of those. So that's micro-edit. Still in micro-edit, it's possible to actually isolate a note and delete it. So find the offending note, and then, whilst holding down Shift and Function together, press the shown note once again, and the, the light associated with that key will disappear. And that note has been erased again. Let's try it with this one. There's the note. Shift Function. Press the note, and it's gone. Still in micro-edit, we can actually insert notes as well as delete notes. Now, normally when we're moving through the recorded data, we move swiftly from one event to the next. However, if we actually hold down the Shift button and rotate the dial, we can move in individual clock ticks. So we can home in on a specific location and then whilst holding down shift and function, add or insert a new note. So you can see now this note has been inserted at that location. Now let's look at some of the pattern edit features. If you need to modify one of the preset patterns, you'll first need to copy it over to a user memory location. And this is how we do it. Let's assume that we've selected pattern A01 and we want to actually modify it. First, let's copy it. Shift function copy, which is located under key number one. And then we have the choice of whether to copy the pattern information plus the setup data, which is all, just the setup data, or just the pattern information. Well, I'm going to copy the whole thing. So pattern, copy all, enter. Destination. Well, I'm actually going to look for a, a user pattern, which is empty. And we know it's empty because it's a lowercase u denoting the pattern number. I could actually copy to u01, but it will overwrite what's actually in this location already. So let's go to u08. Enter. Sure. Enter again confirms. And that's now done. It's also possible to take one part within a preset pattern and copy this to a user pattern, thereby allowing us to create a composite user pattern from various different parts from different patterns. To do this, we shift function part copy. And again, we have the choice of taking all the information, or just the setup data, or just the pattern data. I'm going to take it all for part two. Enter. Now, my source part, therefore, part two. My destination part, well, let's actually copy it to part two in the destination pattern. This is my destination pattern. I'm going to select, well, let's select user 26, which already contains some part two information. Press enter. And now it asks me where I want to put down that information. And I have a choice. I can lay it down either at the end, so it joins on, segues, if you like, to the original data, or I can place it at the beginning, or at measure two, measure three, measure four, and so on. I'm actually going to join it onto the end. Press Enter. Are you sure? Press Enter again to confirm that. Now, to erase data within a pattern, do as follows. First, select the pattern, and then Shift Function Erase. Firstly, we need to define which parts are going to have data erased from them. So let's, for example, isolate part two. And then I have to specify the start measure and end measure that I want to erase. Now, this is actually a four measure loop. So I could erase, for example, from measure two 
to the end. Are you sure? Enter. We can also choose to delete information. And the difference between deleting and erasing is that erasing will take away the data but leave a space where the data originally sat. Deleting will also remove the space, so a four-measure loop. If we decide to delete measure two, we'll end up as a three-measure loop, as opposed to a four-measure loop with a gap in measure two. We can also insert whole measures within a pattern. This is how we do it. Shift function, insert. Let's decide which of the parts we want to insert space into. Let's select all eight. At what point do I want to insert the measure? Let's go to measure three. And I want to insert two measures. Sure? Yes. So my basic four measure drum loop now has two measures of space inserted after the second measure. making a total of six measures. So I can now go back and record over that gap to create a new pattern. Now we saw earlier how we can transpose on the fly by pressing this button here. But if we want to actually permanently transpose uh, a particular pattern, we can do it. Now, this is my pattern, user eight, and it's in this key. Let's go to edit transpose. First, we have to specify which of the parts we want to transpose. We could just transpose one of the parts. Now, I'm going to transpose all of the musical parts, leaving the drums untransposed. If I actually transpose the drums, I'm going to get all the wrong drum sounds coming out. So uh, leave that where it is. This is the transpose amount, and I can go plus or minus two octaves in semitone steps. So let's try plus three semitones. Enter. Are you sure? Yes. And that's permanently changed the key of the instruments in this particular pattern. We can edit the velocity and gate components of a particular part within a pattern. So if we need to actually increase all of the velocities by a certain degree, or lengthen the notes within one part by a certain degree, we can do this globally. Let's have a look at the velocity change. Shift function, change velocity. And we can bias the velocity for a given part. Let's say, for example, part two, the bass. We can actually bias this. Plus or minus 99 velocity levels. OK, so if I leave that on 99, I'll end up with constantly maximum velocity. And so on. Once I've selected my bias value and the part that I wish to actually edit, just hit enter and sure, and it's done. And exactly the same thing can be done with the gate time. If we select change gate, again, you can target a particular part, and we can bias the gate time either in a positive or negative direction. Sometimes we need to actually change the timing of a part, maybe bring the bass part slightly forward in time, slightly ahead of the, the drum kit, for example, just to change the feel of the overall pattern. And we can do that very easily by using the shift clock facility. So shift function, shift clock. Isolate the part that you want to shift, and then move the whole part with respect to the rest of the pattern in clock ticks, either plus 99, all the way down to minus 99. So we're actually shifting by almost, or just over, in fact, a quarter note. Once you've decided on the shift, again, press Enter and confirm. If you've recorded a pattern using a lot of pitch bend data, or maybe some real-time modify data, you'll find that a large amount of data has been recorded into the sequencer. It's actually possible to thin this out without changing the sound of the pattern playback. It will help conserve memory. And the way we do this is to use the data thin command. Shift function data thin. Specify 
the track to be thinned, and then change the data thin amount. Low values will actually thin the data very little. Higher values will thin it more. Now the last of the pattern edit commands is the edit quantize command. I've already shown you how you can actually use the play quantize feature up here. But if you want to permanently and destructively quantize one of the user patterns, you can do this. First, set up the play quantize so that it sounds the way you want it to sound. Here's a, here's a basic pattern. Now I'm going to groove quantize this pattern. That's got the right sound. So let's stop the playback, shift function quantize, and this says edit quantize, enter. Are you sure? Enter. So what it's doing is basically making a permanent version of what we heard when we played back the pattern. In other words, I can now get exactly the same result without having to use playback quantize at all. And this frees up the play quantize for me to apply to other parts. On the MC303, we can combine patterns to create what's known as a song. OK, now we can actually store up to 10 songs in the unit, and each song can contain up to 999 patterns. I have three patterns here, user 20, 21, and 22. They're actually the same pattern, transposed. I'm actually going to create a song using these three patterns. So the first thing I need to do is go into song mode. If I go to the play mode button and press it once, I switch to song mode, and the display actually shows song number eight. And this means that the song is actually blank. I've got quite a few other songs in there already. So let's go to song eight, press record, and I'm actually able to start specifying which pattern corresponds to which part of the song. So part one, I'm going to set to playback user 20. There. And when I'm happy with that, I press enter. Part 2, user 21. If you make a mistake at this stage, you can shift backward to move back to a previous part and re-specify. So part 1, user 20. Part 2, user 21. And part 3, user 22. Enter, and when you're finished, press exit. So let's now listen to the song. So that's the basic three pattern song. Now just like when we're editing in pattern mode, we can also create edits in song mode. And you can see down here that the, the white edit functions, some of them are actually highlighted in bold, copy, delete, and insert. So we can actually use these edit functions in the song mode. We can copy songs, we can delete parts of a song, and we can insert parts within the song. Now, if you decide you want to use an external controller keyboard to trigger the sounds within the MC, this is how you do it. You take a MIDI cable from the MIDI out of your keyboard into the MIDI in on the back of the MC, okay? and then you'll be able to play the sounds directly. It doesn't even matter which MIDI channel you're transmitting on. You will play the sound that is currently selected under Part Select. Okay. You can also use MIDI for uh, controlling or synchronizing to an external sequencer. So this will generate MIDI clock information, which the sequencer can clock to, or you can actually work this the other way around and clock the MC303 from an external sequencer. You can use an external sound module to actually play back some of the sounds from the MC303, and I showed you how to switch between internal and external. In that scenario, you'd connect a MIDI cable from the MIDI out on the MC to the in on your external sound module. And finally, one last feature 
um, regarding the MIDI implementation is this feature down here called Dump. Now, if you actually fill up the internal memory of the MC303, you can actually create some more space by dumping the internal memory to an external MIDI sequencer and then erasing some of the internal pattern memory, thereby creating more space for your work. And to do that, we simply shift function dump, which is under key 16. And the display says send, and if we press enter, it will now send all of the internal data via the MIDI out socket to the external device. And you can record this just as though it was standard MIDI data and archive it. And if you ever need to reload it, simply play the external sequence data via the MIDI in into the MC and it will reload everything that you had originally. Using the MIDI in socket on the back of the MC-303, it's possible to trigger the internal sounds directly from an external MIDI device. I have here the Roland PC-200 Mark II, which is a mother keyboard, a controller keyboard, if you like. It doesn't contain any sounds, but it does actually have a MIDI socket on the back, marked MIDI out. I've taken an ordinary MIDI cable and connected from MIDI out to MIDI in on the back of the MC. This then allows me to trigger the sounds directly from the keyboard. Now, it's often more useful and certainly easier to play the sounds from a full-size keyboard than from the internal keypads. I also have one or two other advantages. For a start, velocity sensitivity. This means when I play gently, I get a quiet sound. If I play a bit harder, I get a louder sound. I also have control over the pitch bend and modulation. So I end up with more direct expression from the keyboard. Now this keyboard can actually transmit on 16 different MIDI channels, but that's not something you really have to worry about because the MC303 will receive on all MIDI channels and the selected part will be the one that is heard. So if I select the rhythm part, I play the drums. Part two, and so on. So that's how we can use an external MIDI keyboard to trigger the sounds. Well, so far we've been using the MC-303 in an eight-part mode. It's possible to reconfigure the unit to 16-part multitombral operation. This means we get 16 different parts with different instruments on each part. To do this, we have to boot up in a slightly different way. Firstly, switch the machine off. Now, whilst holding down the play mode button, turn on. The unit will boot up, but the display will remain showing MC303. Now, at this stage, all of the front panel controls are disabled, with the exception of the master volume control. We have 16 parts. Each of those parts can contain one of the 448 sounds. Each part is also associated with a MIDI channel. My mother keyboard, my controlling keyboard, is transmitting on one of 16 MIDI channels. At the moment, I've got this set to transmit on MIDI channel 1. And the sound that the MC-303 has set up on channel 1 is this one. Now, suppose I want to actually change that sound. Well, obviously, I can't do it using the front panel controls because they're now disabled. We have to use MIDI to actually change the sound. And you can do this either from your MIDI keyboard, if it has uh, a MIDI implementation that allows this, or from your MIDI sequencer, if you're using one. So let's just look at the PC-200 as an example. That's my basic sound. Now, to select an alternative sound, I have to resort to the manual, which you should have handy. Now, the tone listings actually show a tone number, a bank number, and the tone name. Now, just before the tone name, you can see here PC hash CC0 hash. Well, what's this all about? These are two MIDI messages, program change messages and controller messages. Now, as we have 448 tones to choose from, we need to combine these two messages in order to make our selection. So let's just have a look at the bank six, the strings bank. I want to select on MIDI channel one, real strings one. And you can see I have a program change command 29 and a controller zero command 64. Now, we always transmit the controller before the program change. So let's just go to the keyboard. I'm going to select, for controller 0, a value of 64, and enter it. 
followed by a program change of 29. Enter. And now, as you hear, I've selected the string sound. Now I could repeat this operation and actually select sounds for all of the 16 parts. Bear in mind, however, that MIDI channel 10 is reserved for the drums, so we can only select drum sounds on MIDI channel 10. Now in the case of my PC200, uh, program change number and controller number are actually selected using the keyboard keys, their dual function. However, not all controlling keyboards work in the same way, so if you're using an external keyboard, you will need to consult the manual um, to find out exactly how you transmit this information. You may find that your keyboard is not actually equipped with this facility, in which case you'll need to use your sequencer to select the relevant sounds within the MC303, but most modern sequencers actually give you this facility. Now, if you need to leave this mode, simply switch the unit off and then on again, and we boot up to the normal MC303 operation. Now many of you may be integrating your Groovebox into an existing studio setup. Some of you may be using software-based sequencers such as Cubase or Notator Logic. Others of you may be using hardware sequencers like this one, the MC50 Mark II. Perhaps you have a collection of old drum machines or maybe a VS880 hard disk recording system. Now, to integrate these units, to get them all to run together, we need to use some form of synchronization. Consider the scenario. You have your VS880 and you've recorded some live guitar parts, maybe even some vocals. You have an old drum machine that you'd like to actually bring in, use some of those old sounds, and maybe a bass line playing back from your, your workstation. First thing you need to do is decide which is going to be the master unit and which units will slave to its clock information. Now, the synchronization code is actually called MIDI clock. And nearly all sequencers, nearly all drum machines, and certainly the VS880 digital workstation transmits MIDI clock information. So we need to slave the MC303 to this information. And to do that, we first need to set up the synchronization. Well, here's a pattern, A21, and it plays back freely. Well, that, that's actually no good to us, because that will just free run, and will gradually run out of time with anything else that's running. So we need to set up a system parameter. If we go into the system area and look for SY1, that's sync 1, and at the moment it's set to internal. Simply switch this to slave, SLV, and then exit, and the MC303 is now ready to receive and synchronize to MIDI clock. Having connected the MIDI output from my sequencer to the MIDI input on the MC303, I can generate MIDI clock directly. Watch what happens if I press play on the sequencer. and stop, the MC303 follows suit. Now, I can see my sequence is running back at a tempo of 123 beats per minute. If I speed up and slow down the tempo of the sequence data, you can hear that the MC303 will respond exactly and stay perfectly in sync. Speeding up. And slowing down. Now, nearly all sequencers work in the same way, so although I'm using a hardware sequencer here, software-based sequencers should work in exactly the same way. So that's synchronization. Now, we've seen earlier how to modify the sounds in real time using the real-time modify controls. We've also seen that when we're in 16-part multitombral mode, all of the front panel controls are disabled. So how do we modify the sounds when we're doing this? Well, the answer is that we use MIDI messages to do the same thing. Some software sequencers have the facility for creating what's known as a mixer map, which is a collection of virtual faders on the screen which will target and adjust a particular parameter within the MC303. One company called eMagic has produced a software package called Logic, and this um, has available to it a template designed specifically for the MC303. So very, very easy matter simply to modify the sounds and record those modifications as part of your sequence data. If you're using a hardware sequencer or another software sequencer which doesn't implement the idea of mixer maps, it means you have to use uh, your own MIDI messages created from scratch to do the same job. And these MIDI messages are called non-registered parameter numbers. Now, if you take a look in the back of the manual at the MIDI implementation, look for NRPN, non-registered parameter number, and you can see a listing of all of the targetable parameters. 
Now, to target a parameter requires the transmission of two controller messages, controllers 99 and 98, followed by the variable, that's the data entry controller. And upon reception of the data entry controller, that parameter will be modified. So once the target has been defined, you can then dynamically change the value for that target and record it just as though it was note information into your sequencer, hence recording the real-time modification of the sound. Well, that's just about all we've got time for. I hope you've enjoyed watching, and until next time, goodbye. <laughs>